Say amen. amen. You know what amen means? Anybody know? Why do we say that word amen? I agree. There's another one. Let it be so. So be it. Those three terms all reflect amen. So now you understand that when someone cries out for an amen or you hear something that you can agree with, even if you don't know if you're practicing it, but you're agreeing that that's right, you can say amen. You can shout it. You can type it. You can spell it. You can do whatever, however, send up a smoke signal. Hey, men. I don't know if they still do those nowadays, but you could always try it. Um, agreeing with what God says, agreeing with what his word says, that's, that's the key. That's the key that God wants and the page that he wants you on is agreeing with him and what he's doing in us. How many got involved with Jesus just because you were looking for fire insurance? <laughs> Nobody wants to answer that. <laughs> Dare I not? But <clears throat> sometimes people have that, that mindset that they, they are just worried about the, the eternity aspect. But they're hoping they can ride the line here um, without really letting God get involved in their life other than some form of eternal protection. But can I tell you that the whole concept of eternity is not in the perspective in the message of salvation. You say, what? I thought it's all about eternal life or eternal death. It's bigger than that. Those things have their consequentials. But the reason why God got involved in our lives is because he wants relationship with us. He wants to know us. He wants us to know him. He wants to be involved in our life. And here's the kicker. He wants to heal us from our malady. You say, well, I didn't even know I had a malady. Sin is a malady. And that's why the price couldn't be cheap. It had to be expensive. Heaven paid the dearest blood when he paid for our sin. I'm not just trying to wax eloquent. I'm just trying to be real. Heaven had to bankrupt itself to save us because sin is so devastating to the soul. The scriptures say that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. That word death means cessation, separation, ceasing. That's why Jesus came to offer eternal life because it's the opposite of eternal death that people head for. Now, the relationship aspect is the focus of what Jesus came to bring. And the benefits of it, of course, is being able to be with him in eternity and dwell with God and God dwelling with us. But his motive, his prime operation, his prime purpose for coming was to connect with his creation on a personal level. And he had to do this by unfolding the who he is and was over time. That's why the story of God opens up in Genesis and goes all the way to Revelation. It is the, the opening up of the revealing of this almighty, invisible, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, omnipresent being who is unfathomably powerful, rich in wisdom and power and glory. And how could he relate to human beings if he remained forever in that ominous presence? It's hard to have a relationship with an invisible God. Put it simple. So he planned to come down in person. <laughs> you can't get it any better than that. He said, I will go down and dwell among them and bring them and draw them to me. That was the appearance of Jesus. God 
in the flesh. The Word in flesh. Hallelujah. Oh, we don't want to miss any opportunity of what God wants to do in us when he's gone through all that to come to us. How can we be cavalier? How can we be nonchalant? He invested everything to know us, to move in us, to breathe in us. The Apostle Paul said it this way, in him we live and we move and we have our being. We consist in him. That's how it is meant to be. But that's not for everybody. That's for those who receive him. What does the scripture say in John chapter 1, verse 12? To as many as received him, to them, to them, no, I thought we were all God's children. To as many as received him, to them he gave the power to be the children of God. I know I'm being dramatic, but I love it. <laughs> I just love that verse, and I love the message of the word that he invested so much for you and me. How could we say, well, Lord, you know, Keep a distance. We'll, we'll, we'll work something out, but, you know, I don't have to be that close to you, do I? Because I know that getting that close to you could affect me in ways that I'm not really ready to surrender. You say, well, you know, how does God handle that? Well, he knows that. He knows that about us, that as human beings flawed and bound in the casing of sin, your, 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 your body, contaminated and affected by sin, your soul contaminated and affected by sin, but your spirit, now redeemed, now delivered, and now transformed, God is saying, I know that you don't always like it. <laughs> I don't know you're always a fan of me changing you, but part of my redemptive work of pulling you out of the mess that you were born into and thus compounded by your life and conditions and culture, and atmosphere, and all the things that you have done, I'm going to change and mold you and shape you, and I know you're going to resist it at times, but I'm going to draw you and keep wooing you. And some of the ways I'm going to do that is through the power of the Word. The Word is going to minister to you, and that's why when you leave church sometimes, you say, oh, man, yeah, that was a good, oh, that was a good service, but it ripped my guts out. <laughs> Well, how did that happen? That happened at church? <laughs> you know, you're telling somebody about it and they're trying to figure you out and you're like, oh, yeah, no, no, it was, it was, it was something he said and it just, it, just, it just got with me and touched with me and I felt it and man, the only good news that I got out of that is knowing that I am not able to do this on my own and he has provided the way. That I know I need to change. I know there are things about me that cannot remain the same lest it basically consume me. But I know that he is able to change me. And I know he begins with my heart. And they say, oh man, he goes after the heart. Yeah, see, too many people think that God is always trying to deal with your surface problems. Now, I'm not saying your surface problems or my surface problems aren't problems. But they're reflections, they're outgrowths of a deeper problem. That problem is the problem of sin. And so Jesus dealt a blow to sin when he died on the cross and took our legislative punishment upon himself. How we would have been judged eternally, he took it on himself so that we wouldn't be judged. And all we would need to do is place our faith and trust in him and what he did on the cross, and that brings redemption. It brings spiritual rebirth. It brings change. And then his Holy Spirit then comes involved. The Bible says his Spirit dwells in us and enacts a process. Everybody say process. Of change throughout the rest of your life until he conforms you to the image of his son. So if you've ever wondered what process you're in, that's the process you're in. And God's just trying to get us to comply. And so if you're telling the story to somebody else, you can tell them God is working 
in me and on me, and he ain't done with me yet. Yeah, I may not be what I might be someday. I plan on being that someday, but I know I'm no longer what I used to be because God is changing me. Now, my job is just to help you along in that process to tell you that the more we yield like clay to the potter's hand, the better in the 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 more equipping he is able to shape us and mold us. So uh, there's an old, old song. It says, have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter and I am the clay. Mold me and make me after your will. While I am waiting, yielded and still. (laughs) Hold still now. This won't hurt a bit. <laughs> I wonder sometimes if the Lord says that. No, 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 this won't hurt. <laughs> no, I'll, I think he knows there are times that there are some hurts and there are some pains. It's my discipline, friends. This is a little side note. I won't charge you for it. That's why discipline is important with your children. Because in some manner, whatever methods or means that you discipline your children... What it does was, is it inflicts a form of pain, and I'm not talking about beating your kids, don't misunderstand. I'm talking about you take away something from your child, you remove a privilege, or you do any form of discipline that they don't like. You're telling them what the world is like. The world is not easy, the world is not good. But there are things in our lives that are unhealthy, unsafe, and damaging, And a good parent will bring in some forms of discipline in order to redirect and change the child's life. Are you with me so far? God does the same things in spiritual things. There are things in our life that he wants to change. He wants to adjust. He wants to remove. And we could be stubborn like a child. You can't do that to me. I'm not letting God have his way. I'm not yielded and still either. (laughs) And you'll continue being a baby. And you'll continue being selfish. And you'll continue to reap the results of being selfish. And that can bring harm to you. And God would rather not have you harmed. He doesn't want to see you harmed. He doesn't want to see you spiritually harmed, physically harmed, and harmed in any way. But because we live in a fallen world, there is harm that comes. We're in harm's way born in harm's way. But God wants to do a process of changing us in that work. He wants to change us and deliver us until ultimately we are delivered completely, body, soul, and spirit. And we long for that day. I'm sorry for that being a long introduction, but uh, that's an introduction to the message I started two weeks ago. And so I'm going to uh, continue. We talked to you about change. He changed me. We gave you a prophetic word that you get to speak early. That's why I call it prophetic. Early in the year 2023. It just started. But this word, he changed, past tense, he changed me in 2023. Is something you can speak prophetically now, predicting that that is what you're going to be saying at the end of this year. Isn't that cool? You get to prophesy. The Bible says, I wish above all things that you would prophesy. So here's your opportunity. Every, are you, you all ready to prophesy? What? If somebody ever asks you, go, did you actually ever prophesy? And you go, yes, I remember the day. What was that day? The day I said, he changed me in 2023. Well, 2023 just started. Exactly. I prophesied. So are you ready? Everybody say, he changed me. In 2023. Let's do it one more time. Ready? Say it out now. Say it out. Prophesy. The Bible says, Son of man, daughter of man, prophesy these words. Ready? He changed me. In 2023. You guys, right on it. Declare that thing to be so. That's the word that this is about. This is, this is getting on board with what God's doing. That, that's what we want to do. All right. So, We told you that God is in the change business. We told you that our salvation from sin is a change business. We gave you those old cliches of I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was bitter, but now I'm better. 
broken, but now I'm fixed. That's changed. That's the change we're talking about. And we gave you ultimately the first scripture so that you could really get the meaning of what God is behind and what he's always up to. And that is 2 Corinthians 5, 17, which says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Say, I'm a new creation. If anyone's in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. In the, in the Greek of that, there is a continuous sense of all things become new. In other words, it's a process. Doesn't that you didn't, you know, when you, when you gave your life to Jesus, when you finally surrendered and said, yes, Lord, be Lord of my life, you didn't walk away from there all shaped up and, and physically looking beautiful. Your hair is set in place. And uh, for those of you who don't have any, you suddenly got new hair. None of that happened, in case you didn't know. Some people get into salvation just hoping that they'll get some kind of physical change, benefit out of that. Doesn't quite work that way, but there is a change that happens. Something happens on the inside. The Bible says you are reborn, spiritually regenerated. Your spirit is made alive from dead in sin, alive to God in Christ Jesus. Woo! And then a process begins. All things start becoming new. Old things start passing away. All things start becoming new. Old things pass away. Someone says, well, what if I don't change? Well, then something's wrong because this is what happens. Now, it doesn't happen overnight, but it does happen. You know, you can't plant an apple tree and expect to see apples the following day or even within a week or two. But over time, you start to see something crop up. When you're in Christ, fruit comes, plants come, they grow and they mature. Change is all about the ongoing process of that. And you say, well, when does God finish it? When you're dead. When you're dead and delivered, when you rise. In other words, the change goes on as long as you're drawing breath. Right. I, I, I wanted an amen. <laughs> we taught you about amens, didn't we? Change goes on, right, as long as you're alive. Amen. All right, glad you're agreeing. All right. It'd be a waste of my time if you're not agreeing. <laughs> I wonder what's my, what's my function. Here's an axiom we gave you. Change is the doorway to spiritual growth and the only key to a fruitful life. Get that? Change is the doorway. Oh, I was going through that doorway. What doorway was that? That's the doorway of change. I started allowing God to change me and affect my character, my person, my nature, the, the way I act, the way I live, the way I think. Someone says, wow, it sounds like you went through a doorway. I did. And it's the doorway to a spiritual life and the only key to a fruitful life. Fruitful living, fruitful Christians get results. Amen? We gave you two realities, a negative reality and a positive reality. I'm going to go through them quickly. Change, here's the negative reality. They both begin with a positive. Change is essential to growth. Everybody say that. Change is essential to growth. But if we don't change, we don't grow. If we don't grow, we don't mature. If we don't mature, we don't develop. If we don't develop, we don't produce. And if we don't produce, we won't be fruitful in our lives. All at the root of change. Because change is essential for growth. Here's the positive reality. Change is essential for growth. Same thing. So if we do change, we will grow. And as we grow, we will mature. And as we mature, we will develop. And as we develop, we will produce. As we produce, we will become fruitful in our lives. That is God's promise. Now, two weeks ago when I was bringing forth this message, I then stepped into an illustration about the power of light. And I want to further that illustration before I press on and continue the second part of this. I want to bring you back to this point. Are you ready? The first act in creational change was light overcoming darkness. You know that. Uh, well, if you were here for the Christmas service, you saw our demonstration of that. Let there be light. We, we turned off all the lights in the house, and boom, darkness was everywhere. And then we said, let there be light, and light came on. And light overcomes darkness. Light is essential for all growth on planet Earth. Did you know that? Now, this is the principle that I'm showing you, so I, I want you to get this. This is a scientific principle, but it's also a spiritual principle. Light is essential 
for all growth. You know how the Bible says, this then is the message. God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So, I'm sorry, but you're connected to the being, the, the only one powerful being who is light. He is light. No way to get around that. Light is the uh, essential action for all growth on planet Earth. All, listen to this. All plant and vegetable life grows from this light. It's called photosynthesis, and it produces change. It's how change takes place. Everything that grows on this Earth comes as a result of the power of light. Even you and I, when we're out sunbathing, are getting blasts of vitamin D from the power of light, which is healthy to the human body. It's essential. Every human and every animal and every creature living on the face of the globe needs this light. The light produces, in effect, the change, which produces growth, which produces development, which produces the maturing of all living things, and this is a natural truth. We get to see the things in the natural so that we can understand in the spiritual. You've heard someone say, I've said it several times, that what is true in the natural is true in the spiritual. You have to get that. That's, a, that's an eternal principle. You have to get it. It's a Bible principle. It's a God principle. What's true in the natural, God will demonstrate to be true in the spiritual. And learning to discern those things and how God's working will save you a lot of headaches, by the way, when you're going through changes because you'll know who's behind the change. You say, there's something else that works to change me? Well, outside of the Lord and the Lord of light, there are changes that we have a propensity. My pastor used to use that word a lot. It drove me crazy because I'd be like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, we'd have a propensity. And I'd be like, a propensity is what? I was much younger. And finally he said, he goes, it's an inner mooring, uh, 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 something that compels you from the inward, particularly by nature. Your nature drives you and moves you. There are propensities for you to do certain things. You know that, right? No, that's the way he always acts. He has this way about him. It seems to always come out. And it's the direction he so quickly adapts to, goes into, she or anyone. We have propensities to go into darkness. We have propensities to get into trouble. And we have propensities. I know this might be a little offensive, but hear me. We have propensity to listen to the voice of a false shepherd. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and a stranger's voice they will not follow. But yet, God's own sheep at times haven't discerned the difference between a good shepherd, a true shepherd, and a bad shepherd, a hireling. And the hirelings are not always in church. The stranger's voice is not always in church. The stranger's voice are the voices of those outside here, outside of the general church. Now, they can be in the church, too, because there are false shepherds in churches, false teachers, false leaders. And at times we succumb to that, and sometimes not having our radars up, not recognizing that, and get sucked into those things, and it produces false, poor, dangerous, and deadly changes because we buy into the propaganda or we buy into the selling item or we buy into their wares, whatever it is, whether it's coming over the, 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 the electrodes of the television set, the airwaves of the radio or any of those things. Friends, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of voices out there that are producing negative changes in us and we need to recognize that. That's why we tell you don't be undiscerning. Don't be like foolish children, the Bible says, tossed about by every wind of doctrine and teaching and ideology and idea. Again, not just in the church, but outside of the church as well. Watch out, because those things will corrupt you and change you in ways that are not healthy. I didn't plan on saying any of that. 
So that must have been by the Spirit on that one. A little extra boost by our Heavenly Father. But we do need to be cautious. Be, care be careful, friends, of what you allow and pour into your spirit. Be careful of the stuff you listen to. I'll just leave it at that. Because you don't want the false changes, you want the true changes. You want the real changes that come from the Lord of light. Our God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So he's always putting in the goods. The Bible says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. Woo! As Pastor Chet would say. <laughs> Woo! Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights, who bestows on all those, like an open petal of a flower, opens up to receive that light. You go, yeah, I wish I was that cooperative. <laughs> right, well, that's my point. We're not that cooperative. <laughs> We're like the closed flower going, no, no, no. But if you stay under the light long enough, it'll force those petals to open and cause depth and growth to start working and change. Are you with me so far? So this is what we've been talking about. We told you that spiritual light has come into the world, but it doesn't just produce life just because it's there. As Christians, we must respond to the light and allow the light to produce change in us. All right. Okay. Now, I'm excited to connect this to the second part and final part of this message. Um, mm -mm -mm -mm. The scripture says that if, if these things that I'm about to bring to you are yours and abound, you will neither be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. You won't be barren or unfruitful anymore. The knowledge of the truth will permeate your being and it produces change and fruit. Guaranteed. If you've, if you've sometimes looked at your life and said, I just feel so unfruitful, well, you've probably gone through a long time where you might have resisted change or resisted the light in certain areas. But if you really want the light to do its job and God to do, con continue to do his work, working in you, both to will and to do his good purpose, his good pleasure, then you need to cooperate with the light and let the light do it. Let the light speak to you. Let God's word speak to you. Let the Holy Spirit guide you in your actions, behaviors, and things that you say and do. Are you with me? Say amen. You get, sometimes you got to put a little southern flavor. Amen. You say, but I'm not in the south. I'm in the north. Okay. So we told you these things, because the Bible says these things, let them, let them build up and let them add them one to another. We told you faith, which is the abiding in the vine and trusting in the Lord. You need to add virtue to faith, which is a behavior showing high moral standard, moral excellence, and conformity to right. In other words, letting Jesus' behavior become your behavior. So you add to your faith virtue, which is moral behavior. Knowledge gets added to, to that virtue, living and loving the truth, following the word of God and walking in the principles of the kingdom of God. These are all life-changing uh, moments that, that affect you, and you add them one to another, self-control. Well, the reason why a lot of Christians are in trouble lately is because they don't allow the spirit of God, the self-control, which is a fruit of the spirit of God working in your life. They don't allow that self-control to have its way because they're not eating from the vine and the source of life they're eating from another trough there I said it <laughs> it's just a habit we have we, the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 2 I'm just going to quote it because I don't remember exactly what part but in Jeremiah chapter 2 it says this my people, my people, whose people? my people, God's people have committed two evils one, they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. And two, they've hewn them out for themselves another cistern. Broken ones, too, that can't even hold any water. And the water that they did hold usually hold 
filthy water, and they drink from those. My people have committed two evils. They turn away from the actual living water that produces fruit and produces change, and they drink after they've created of their own desires and pursuits from an area that produces only muddy water, if it produces anything at all. So God's been dealing with this problem since the days of Jeremiah with his own people. I resort back to my job. My job is to make you aware of that. (laughs) And to make me aware of that. And remind me of that. And remind us of that. So that we can get a back, get a back, get back to drinking of the fountain of life, getting the true sustenance that comes from abiding in the vine and allowing the fruit to produce naturally and getting away from the things that don't produce real fruit, getting away from dirty water. Do I have to actually say stop drinking dirty water? Right? Well, I love that dirty water. (laughs) Boston is my home. Well, (laughs) listen... You got to call out when there's dirty water and and stay away from that and get back to the fresh, clean water that Jesus spoke about. That'll be a spring of living water dwelling inside your soul. Amen? All right. Just want to make sure I'm making sense. So you say you don't have the ability to change by yourself. You're absolutely right. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. He said that in John 15 when he was talking about the fact that unless you're abiding in the vine... Adding to your faith and drinking of that vine, you'll never be able to produce any fruit. But if you are abiding in the vine, you will. So you got that knowledge, you got the self control, and you got perseverance that adds to self control. What is perseverance? We did a whole three part series on, on endurance and perseverance. And if you need to hear that, well, you need to hear that. So you might want to check those messages again. Pressing on in the face of resistance and courage in the face of fear. That means, it doesn't mean that you'll never be afraid, but it means you press on in the face of fear with courage. Courage is a sign that you're probably afraid, but you're pressing on anyway. It's not the necessary removal of all fear. There are fearful things here. Some people are fearful of change. They don't even want change. Some people have to be converted just to get them to want change. That could be a battle. But God will engage in it with you. All right. At, for, to perseverance, we add godliness, which is a God-centered life, to be like him, to reflect him in his character. To godliness, we, we add brotherly kindness, being kind and caring, burden-bearing, uh, showing love to the brethren. And then lastly, love, the ultimate sense of love. Let me just take a, a quick gander of First Corinthians chapter 13. You all have heard it many times. I'm going to read it to you out of the ESV. We don't have it to come up on the the picture for you, but I am going to say this. Here's what it says. Here's what love is. The only book in the world that actually has a definition of love, and it's the Bible. Here's what it says. Love never ends. Um, Well, it does say that, but that's what it says at the end. (laughs) Let's try it from the beginning. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable easily or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things. Love endures all things. Love never ends. So did you notice, though, that in the definition of this term love, which we are to add to all the other virtues that I had mentioned, none of those love terms were feelings. That's a plot of the enemy today under a false shepherd and a false voice. Strangers' voices, strangers in the night, stranger voices speaking in the night. Um, these strange voices try to tell you what love is, but they're wrong because they tell you love is based on feelings, how you feel. And how you feel now determines how you act or behave. But that's not true. This love that is agape love, meaning unselfish, unconditional, perfect love that God is, is a love 
is a love is not rooted in feeling, it's rooted in behavior. In other words, to really have love and to add love to your faith is to add behavior of love. Love is right behavior. It's kindness when you feel like ripping someone's head off and instead you give kindness. It's mercy given to the unmerciful. It's forgiveness when every time you look at them, you want to take revenge or retaliate, but you give mercy instead. You forgive and you let God be your judge that you did the right thing. And you let God deal with the vengeance if it was due to somebody. There are times people do things that were wrong to you. But if you let that bitterness creep in you and convert and change you, you will not get better. You will get bitter and you will get broken. And so you must exemplify by the behavior of love demonstrated to the unlovable or those who have done harm to you or dis despitefully abused you and you show love. As you say, I, I, that's hard for me to do. Hello, of course it is. <laughs> that's why you have Christ living in you to help you do those things that are very difficult in the natural. But what is true and necessary in the natural is true and empowered in the spiritual. Ooh. I can do it. I can forgive that little rat. Oops. <laughs> All right, he's still a rat though, right? I could still say he's a rat. As long as you don't hold it against the rat anymore. You say, well, Jesus never spoke like that. And we're supposed to follow Jesus. That's what Pam said. <laughs> do you know that Jesus called Herod a fox? He goes, you go tell that fox. All right, are you with me? Okay, so I told you and I left you with last week that God has not left you without anything. He has equipped you the last week we were together. He left you with equipment. Let me, I want to bring up 2 Peter 1.3. I don't know if we have that, but I'll read it for you. It says this, For his divine power has granted to us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Oh, that's funny. Because if you didn't hear what I just said, you may not be saved. <laughs> Are you serious? You really believe that? I'm joking. <laughs> My pastor did that to a, a, a group of church members, 500 strong. He was going about his message, just simply preaching his message. And in the middle of his message, he realized the people were not paying attention. And so he simply quipped at the end of his point, and he goes, and friends, if you didn't hear that last thing I just said, you may not be saved. And all of a sudden, you heard a gasp in the church. They were like, oh, play it back, quick. Now, I, I'm saying that in jest, but I, I'm, I'm telling you that so I can remind you of what I just said, because you might have just let it slip by you. So I'll, I'll say it again. All right, it says, therefore, no, that's not it. It says this, for his divine power has granted to us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. I can't do it. Yes, you can, because you've been given the power. Through the true knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and excellence. All change is possible because you have everything you need. You have everything you need. You may not be accessing everything you have been given, but you have everything you need. Here comes a great repeat. Ready? Say, I have everything I need. God made it so. All right. So I'm going to give you now, and we're going to close with this. I'm going to give you three changes that we can begin to affect. Number one. We can change the way we view afflictions and troubles. We have a certain way of looking at it. Do you realize that? Let's look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 16 to 17. It says this, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away. How many know that to be true? <laughs> Yet inwardly, 
We are being renewed day by day. Say what? Outwardly we're wasting away, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. How? For our light and momentary troubles and afflictions are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. It far, in other words, here's how you change your perspective about your afflictions and troubles. You start to realize that they're good for you. <laughs> and you, you, you're probably saying, hey, physician, heal thyself. <laughs> no, I'm preaching to me too. I'm preaching to me too. We have to realize, it says it right there, that the, our momentary troubles and, and, and afflictions are achieving for us, accomplishing for us, an eternal glory that far outweighs everything, outweighs all the trouble that comes because it's doing something to you. So change the way you think about your troubles. Instead of going, I can't stand it. I'll never get ahead. There I go, another, another failure. Fail. Not. Broken. I got so many issues, you don't even know how to count. Or I don't. <laughs> I gave up counting. You know? It's like, it's like people following therapy. Now, this is not against that. I give people spiritual therapy in, in communication and conversation and biblical guidance. But there's something that's very discouraging to a therapist. Did you know that? A true therapist. A caring, real therapist. And that's when the therapist realizes you're not doing anything that they're telling you. <laughs> you're just going there every week or every month to communicate your sorrows and sufferings and your problems, which are genuine. But then they try to help you and you don't follow anything they tell you. Let me ask you a question. How do you expect to really get help? If you only say, doctor, it hurts when I do this, and he says, well, stop doing that. <laughs> and you're like, oh. Well, doctor, I'm not feeling any better. Well, did you take the medicine? Oh, I... No, I didn't pick up the prescription yet. <laughs> well, how do you think you're going to get better? You're not meant to just stay in therapy forever. Am I stepping on toes? Are you guys hearing the honesty of what I'm saying? We have the same issue here. God is trying to give us some therapy. <laughs> His word. So we've got, we've, got to, we've got to change the way we look at all our troubles instead of just talking about them and crying over them. Yeah, they're genuine. But we've got to realize that they're working in our favor. Are you saying I need to be happy next time I get a problem? Well, I don't know if I should look at it that way, but uh, in a spiritual sense, you might want to go, aha, I hate this, <laughs> but it's a new challenge. I will get through it. You say, yeah, it's not all easy, brother. Some things hurt. Some things bring us to tears. Yes, they do. But even those things are working the same thing. You can let your troubles and your sorrows ruin you and destroy you, or you can let them change you. So, change the way you view afflictions and troubles. If we change the way we see our trials and difficulties, we can grow from them instead of being defeated by them. What? If we let those trials and afflictions do their work in us and change us and we respond appropriately, I said respond, not react. I said respond, not react. It actually can become very helpful and fix you. Uh, verse 18 says, so we fix our eyes on Jesus on our eyes on what is seen, but not, uh, but I'm sorry, let me, let, me, let me get that right. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. Every time you get a right focus, you will grow in the kingdom. We do need to realize what we're dealing with. We're dealing with eternal measures and eternal situations, not temporal ones. I know that bothers you. It bothers me when we go through any kind of crisis or issue but I realize that these things are working a far greater weight than just the 
temporary appeasement or temporary happiness. True happiness doesn't come in life like that. They can give you momentary joys, momentary happiness, but they can't give you eternal joy and the stuff that really matters because one day all the noise of all that frivolous and fun stuff that's out there in the world will eventually fade away. And what matters is the concrete, solid, fruitful life that you built and that God built through you give you something truly to live for and you can walk out of it going, I have a life that was worth living and God helped me live it and I no longer chose the dark paths and the dark roads. Let's stop belly aching about our problems. Let's start viewing our issues differently for a change. A change perspective will bring new responses and better results. You can start asking yourself, what can I learn from this? Maybe there's a source of the affliction. Maybe I, instead of me going, the devil got me, the devil got me, the devil got me, and sometimes he will try to get you. But instead of always saying the devil, maybe you can analyze the source and find out if you put your own foot in it. Do you know a lot of times we're reaping the fruit or the results of decisions or actions or statements and things we've done long ago and the crop's just coming in now? You say, well, well great, now, now I'm in an unfixed sauce. I, I, I can't solve that. What, well, you, you always said what we reap, we sow. So there's no way to run that. What do I do, brother? What do I do about all? I got a lot of crop coming in from bad decisions, bad actions, bad choices. What do I do that? Pray for crop failure. <laughs> That's one thing. Pray for crop failure and pray for jubilee. Jubilee was the only time that reaping and sowing, the law of reap, re, reaping and sowing was suspended. I won't go into the details of that, but ask God for a jubilee. Say, Lord, I need a jubilee. I planted some bad seed. And God will say, good, I'll remove a lot of that, but we're going to have to face some of those things and we're going to have to overcome them and they'll be worth it. You guys willing to make those kind of mature steps with the Lord? You start willing to be like that and I'll tell you, you'll see change happen. You'll see God start working in you that you never dreamed was possible. If it... it if it's God, what should I be learning in this? If it's the enemy, what can I do to overcome him? If it's myself, show me, Lord, the error of my way. How many are honest enough to ask God to show him the error of your way? Sometimes what God will tell you, no, it's the enemy that did this. The enemy did this into your life. You can find that in the book of Matthew. But Jesus mentions that. They said, oh, who, who called all these, all these tares to come up in the wheat? And G Jesus gave the example, and he said, the farmer said, ah, the enemy has done this while we were sleeping. That's why they made that movie. Things happen while we sleep, spiritually and naturally. There's so many good points that are coming out today. Are you getting all these? <laughs> you marking these down? If it's myself, show me, Lord, the error of my own way. If it's the world, help me overcome with my faith. How should I behave in this? Appropriate response or lose my head? Keep my cool and be in prayer and trust. How should I act? What should I do? How should I respond instead of react? Should I seek counsel or wisdom? Should I wait? Should I plan? Have a different approach to your trials and your, your, your difficulties. See them differently. That's a change. Change number two. I only got three of them that I'm going to give you. Change number two is this. Change the way we deal with people. All relationships, family and friends and foes. Family, friends and foes. Luke 6, 31 through 33 says this. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Anybody know what you'd like to have done to you? Do it to others. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. But if you do good to those uh, and if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? Even sinners do the same. Instead, love those who don't love you or who are unlovable. Do good unto those who despitefully use you. Pray for those who curse you. Bless those who curse you. Act in the opposite way. Respond in the opposite way. 
with the character of God, and you'll change not only their life, because you know that a soft answer turns away wrath. You ever have that happen? Somebody's ready to rip your head off, and they're like, you did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did that. And you're like, gee, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. And they're like, I need, I need more than that. What do you mean? You, you, and then you did this. And you, yeah, I know. I, yeah, that, that was wrong, too. Hey, I'm really sorry. That, that, was, that was careless. Could you forgive me? What? Eventually, it puts hot coals on their head, and they're like, oh. And finally, they go, oh, forget it. And it turns them away. A soft answer turns away wrath. How you respond in these things, in your trials, in your, in your situations, how to people. That's the best way to show the character of God. It's the best way to show the truth that you've been changed or are changing. If you lend to only those whom you expect a repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to the sinners. Verse 34 says, expecting to be repaid in full. Verse 35 and 36 says, but love your enemies, do good to them who lend to them, uh, do good to them and lend to them, let me make sure I get that right, expecting nothing in return. Then your reward will be great and you'll be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Forgive even as you've been forgiven. Aren't you glad that every time you mess up, foul up, screw up, sin up, and you feel bad, and you go before God and he lavishes forgiveness on you because Christ paid for the price for that sin too and all your sins, and you lavish on his forgiveness and then you get up and then you go find somebody who owes you something or did something to you and you're angry with them and bitter with them and you want to retaliate against them, you want to hurt them. What are you trying to do? Cancel out your own forgiveness? I didn't say that. Jesus said it. For if you forgive men not their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you of yours. What? <clears throat> and I love the way Jesus worded that when he taught us the Lord's Prayer. It includes, in the vernacular, it uses the term as if we're praying, obviously in the first person, right? And we say, Forgive us our debtors or our trespasses as we forgive those, Lord, who trespassed against us. So it's almost like he makes it included in your prayer so that you're aware <laughs> of what you're praying. All right. So change the way you deal with people, all of them. And you, have a, you say, well, I, I, I don't get very many opportunities. Really? Are you living with, with aliens? <laughs> you have people in your life every day. You have family. You have friends. You have foes. You have an opportunity to practice everything I'm talking about with, with the Lord's working through you. And you're never going to be in want of a new nightmare from a friend. <laughs> you say friends. Yeah, even friends. Faithful, the Bible says, are the wounds of a friend. We already know that enemies can wound, but how do you handle that? All right, change number three, and I'm closing with this. Change number three, change the way you deal with the devil. I know that's a strange one. Change the way you deal with the devil. Here, Ephesians 6 says this, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against authorities, against powers of this world's darkness. Remember, you're children of light now against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground and having done everything to stand. Go ahead and stand anyway. Stand therefore. In verse 14 and 16 says this, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness, which is arrayed with your feet. Use the fitted uh, with the readiness of the gospel of peace on your shoes, which are shoes. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish some of the flaming arrows of the devil. All the flaming arrows of the evil one, not some. And take the helmet of salvation, so keep you sane, friends. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the only offensive weapon mentioned. All the rest are defensive. 
offensive. Take the sword of the Spirit. In other words, don't just sit there and take it. I'm not, taking, I'm not telling you to take up the sword and start harming your friends. I'm saying Jesus said, take up the sword of the Spirit, and he went after the devil. Do you remember when Jesus was battling the devil in the wilderness? The Bible says, Satan would say, hey, I know you're starving, you haven't eaten in 40 days, but I know, right, you claim to be the Son of God, so why don't you go ahead and make these stones into bread if you're really the Son of God? And Jesus says, it is written. Here's his sword. It is written, pal. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Bread's not that important. It has its moments. But the word of God is the real bread. And the sword. Then he said, oh, you know, why don't you throw yourself down? And then Satan tried to use the word. Do you know that Satan knows the word too? Tries to use it against us. He'll confuse the scriptures or he'll confound you with something. And then he'll use the word on Jesus, and he did. And he said, for it is written, you throw yourself down, the angels will pick you up and carry you and lift you up so you don't even dash your foot against a stone. That's Psalms 91. And Jesus said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God. So he balanced it off with the sword. All right. The Bible says we wrestle against not human beings, not flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces that are trying to disrupt and harm you. So take up that sword and wear that shield of faith, knowing where you stand. You're you're not a broken piece of machinery that's trying to practice some kind of religion in some old-fashioned church sitting next to a broken-down piano. That's not you. You're a believer, mighty in the faith, mighty in strength, mighty in God, with the shield of faith and the armor of God, child of the king. Stand in the faith is knowing in whom you have righteous relationship with. You didn't earn it. He gave it to you. Right standing with God. You are his child. You don't go in and out of childhood with God. You don't, one minute I'm a child, next minute I'm a child of the devil, next minute I'm a child of God, next minute, you don't vacillate in and out of that. You don't vacillate in and out of salvation either. Now I'm going to hell, now I'm going to heaven, now I'm going to hell, now I'm going to heaven. Stand in the faith, knowing you're secured in him. Your faith and trust is in him, not in you. When the devil realizes you start realizing that, he becomes disarmed. Let the rising, let's start rising above the stress and anxiety that is on this plaguing generation. You know what I mean, right? This generation is plagued with stress, anxiety, and depression. Plagued with it. To the heights it's never been, at least recorded. Let's start rising above that in the name of Jesus. Let's start replacing our fears with faith. Let's start tackling our common temptations. Stop saying I got hit with something so big I couldn't, I couldn't, so big of a temptation I couldn't fight it off. The Bible says you will not be tempted above that you're able to bear. That's the actual Greek of it. You will not be tempted above what you're able to bear, but God will provide a way of escape in every one of those circumstances so that you can endure. Don't say, I can't fight it. Yes, you can. I can't overcome it. Yes, you can. I can't win. Yes, you can. I can do it because he's doing it in me. And all this is the change that he's bringing me. You do this throughout the year and you will see your prophecy that you did this morning come true. You'll say, someone says to you, wow, that was a, that was a wild year, man. I'm barely recovering. And you're going to say, it was wild. It was crazy. But something good happened. What? He changed me in 2023. Oh, man, I can see it. I can feel it. I started to see it happening. I started to see the way I was responding to all those same things that used to stress me out and flip me out and cause me to act in some fleshly manner. Man, I tell you, 
God's given me patience. He's given me goodness. He's given me kindness. He's, he's showing me mercy, so I'm showing mercy. He's showing me love, so I'm showing love. I'm recognizing that the, the problems that I face all the time, I'm recognizing that they're actually working a weight in me that's a glorious thing I'm going to be celebrating about in the future. God's changed my perspective of the enemy. I now know what he's up to. I stopped blaming people for all my problems and I started seeing the real foe. I've also started recognizing where I go off and the things that I do and I'm the result of this, I cause this. I also began to recognize when God is dealing with me on something and I'm blaming the devil and blaming myself and blaming the world and God's out there going, no, actually it's me. <laughs> Needing to deal with you on that. Oh, everything's been changing for me. I had a great change in 2023. You can see it happen. Let's stand to our feet. Just going to pray over you. So I'm going to ask you if you received anything out of this. and I'd like to hear your answer. Did you receive anything out of this today? Do you agree with what you heard today? What's the proper way to respond when you agree to something? Amen. Say what? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Ooh. Let it be so. So be it. I agree. All right, Lord, we agree. You got a church of agreement right here, unity. We agree with you. Now, Lord, you know we're human. You know we're flesh. Help us. Help us to adjust and to walk in these agreements. Continue your work in us like a petal, a flower opening the petal. Go ahead, Lord. Do that work. Change us. Mold us and shape us after your will. While we are waiting, yielded, and still. Thank you, Lord. Now, Father, let them have the comfort of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit invade their minds, their hearts, and their lives. Let them see the work of the hand of the Lord from this day forward in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen and Amen. That's a double amen. You get to do that one too. All right, God bless you. We love you. We look forward to seeing you next week. Also, Bible study is on Wednesday night. If you can't come in person, you can always tune in on YouTube. Um, but uh, we look forward to seeing you either way. Many blessings.